Final Fantasy is one of the longest running, best selling and most critically acclaimed video game series of all time. But even this titan had a humble beginning. In this retrospective, I'll show you what the original game was like, examine how our expectations of games have changed in the last 35 years, and explain what Final Fantasy had in common with the Metroidvania genre. And in the end, I'll give my answer to a very simple question. Is the original Final Fantasy still worth playing today? 30 years is a long time, especially in the video game industry. Comparing scenes from the original Final Fantasy with sequences from the upcoming Final Fantasy 16 must be what studying evolutionary biology is like. How in the world did this evolve from that? Final Fantasy was released for the Famicom in Japan on December 18, 1987 and eventually saw a US release for the NES in May of 1990. Final Fantasy is, of course, a JRPG, or Japanese role-playing game. But at the time the game was released, this genre hadn't actually been born yet. Final Fantasy wasn't the first of its kind either. In 1986, Dragon Quest was released in Japan to massive acclaim and went on to serve as the model for a new genre of games. It was the astounding popularity of the Dragon Quest series that finally convinced Square's management to greenlight director Hironobu Sakaguchi's pitch of a role-playing game inspired by Western titles like Ultima and Wizardry. Today, Square is a titan of the video game industry, but in the mid-80s, they were a brand new company struggling to produce their first hit game. Final Fantasy was a huge gamble, and Sakaguchi has gone on record as saying that this would be his last attempt to make it in the gaming industry. Had the game not sold well, Sakaguchi would have gone back to university. But it wasn't just Sakaguchi's fate that was tied to the game's success. Square itself was balancing on the edge of financial ruin. They needed a hit game to save the company from bankruptcy. With Square's and Sekiguchi's fates tied up in the game's success, it's no wonder the title chosen for this ambitious project was Final Fantasy. Before we begin, I should mention that Final Fantasy has had a number of remakes over the years. These newer versions have improved on the game's graphics and audio, added some cutscenes and dialogue, and made an absolute truckload of improvements to the gameplay. But for this video, I'll be playing and critiquing the original NES version from 1990. I mean, it wouldn't be much of a retrospective otherwise, would it? Final Fantasy doesn't waste time. Without fanfare, the game drops you outside the town of Cornelia. From this moment on, you're on your own. But right from the start, the game demonstrates its core gameplay loop intuitively. Walking around the wilderness will trigger random encounters with monsters that can be defeated to win experience points and gold. Entering a town or castle will provide you with a safe haven where you can recover at inns, save your game and buy weapons, armor and spells that make the hero stronger. Towns also feature NPCs that give you information about the world and where to go next. When you feel ready to tackle the next step of your quest, you can make your way to a dungeon. These caves, temples, and other locations are vast labyrinths filled with monsters, treasure chests, and deadly boss monsters that must be defeated to advance the story. When the game begins, you're restricted to traveling overland by foot, but as you progress through the story, you'll get your hands on a ship that lets you sail on the ocean, a canoe that can go on rivers, and finally an airship that soars over the world. Final Fantasy plays just like you'd expect from a classic JRPG. All the key gameplay components are here right from the start of the series. On the surface, at least. The real differences only become apparent when you look a little more closely. And we should begin by talking about the one thing the Final Fantasy series is most famous for. Its stories. Final Fantasy's story is weird. It is both extremely straightforward and ridiculously complicated. To say that Final Fantasy has a linear story would be an understatement. The game's plot looks like the love child between a broomstick and a lamppost. Basically, it goes like this. 
For centuries, the world has been tormented by the Four Fiends, whose corrupting power has darkened the elemental crystals of wind, water, fire, and earth. This has caused the wind to die, the seas to rage, and the earth to rot, and has blanketed the world with hordes of monsters. You control the Warriors of Light, four young heroes prophesied to save the world from calamity by restoring light to the darkened elemental crystals. Ironically, the original US translation of the game had to call them orbs instead of crystals, because the word crystal was too long. That's how bullcrap 80s technology was. Don't be fooled by Stranger Things. Things were not better in the past. Throughout the game's story, the Warriors of Light travel the world, retrieve objects to unlock new areas, and conquer monster-infested dungeons to challenge and defeat the Four Fiends. In the end, after a big and really confusing twist, the Warriors of Light travel back in time to confront the Archfiend, Chaos, and save the world. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing fundamentally bad about a linear story. Linear stories can tell some of the most gripping, satisfying tales you'll ever experience, including many of the best Japanese RPGs of all time, like Final Fantasy VII or Sukoden II. The strength of a story is rarely in its ideas, but rather in its execution. The real reason Final Fantasy story doesn't hold up today is in how it's told, or more accurately, how it's not told. To tell an engaging story, you need suspense. If the audience already knows what's going to happen, they'll be bored. Suspense comes in so many forms. There's the tension of not knowing whether a character will survive a dangerous situation. There's the urge to know the answer to a great mystery, or to see how a character will react when they come face to face with the person who betrayed them. Final Fantasy has none of that. The heroes simply move from A to B to C, systematically erasing the four fiends and rekindling the light of the crystals. The only sidetracks they make are to obtain whatever key will unlock the next door that blocks their path. The story has no pacing. There aren't any setbacks, no moments of despair, no terrible reversals to raise the stakes of the story as the four fiends fire back. The forces of evil just hang back in their lairs and wait for the warriors of light to come pick them off one by one. The fate of the world hangs in the balance, but there's nothing in the game to really evoke the dire threat posed by the four fiends. The crystals have been corrupted, supposedly, which causes a lot of problems, allegedly, but the one time we do see the fallout of this corruption, in the rotting of the earth that has left the town of Melmond in ruins and its people starving, it's an event that happened in the past and has very little impact on the heroes. There's also no sense of mystery. The game sets up questions, almost by accident, but they are never answered. We never learn why the traitor knight Garland kidnapped Princess Sarah. We never discover why the dark elf Astus has been beefing with the elves. We never find out who the vampire is, or why the pirate Bicke invaded the town of Provoca, or anything really. There are almost no surprises, and when the game finally does attempt a big twist near the end, it does so in the most convoluted, confusing way imaginable. After the Warriors of Light defeat the Four Fiends, we suddenly learn that the real threat is in the past. 2000 years in the past, to be exact. So let me try to wrap my head around this. Apparently, when the heroes defeated Garland, the evil knight was somehow sent back in time, where he encountered the four fiends and somehow sent them forward in time? And this created a time loop that keeps repeating, making the four fiends and Garland effectively immortal. But wait, does that mean the four fiends didn't exist in the present time until Garland was defeated? Was the world totally fine until the heroes defeated Garland? But the sages say the Wind Fiend Tiamat defeated the Lefame people 400 years ago, so doesn't that mean the Four Fiends had been around for centuries? I... I don't know. Freaking time travel plots. I wonder if there was a popular film about time travel in cinemas in the mid 80s. Hmm. There isn't the slightest bit of foreshadowing either. This ridiculous twist comes out of absolutely nowhere. But to be fair, the Final Fantasy series is famous for its complicated, often confusing plotlines, so it's kinda cool to see that this was true from the very start. But as awkward as the game's story is, it's a minor complaint next to the bigger problem. If you were to ask a bunch of people to name the Final Fantasy series' greatest asset, 
one answer will, without a doubt, be more common than any other. The characters. This franchise has such an amazing roster of memorable heroes and unforgettable villains, but here in the series' first entry, it would be a stretch to say the game even has characters. So much of what we've come to expect from a story-driven RPG is missing in this first entry in the series. The four Warriors of Light are completely blank slates. They have no personalities, no feelings, and they don't speak a single line of dialogue. There are no cutscenes to build suspense for an upcoming confrontation or to celebrate a hard-fought victory. There are no slower-paced scenes to express the characters' hopes and fears, show character growth, or let the heroes react emotionally to the events of the plot. These aren't characters to care about or even remember once you finish the story. They're simply the tools you use to play the game. Everything is extremely primitive. NPCs exist, but only a handful even have names, and their only purpose is to shove information down your throat telling you about locations, items, and other characters in the game world, and providing pointers about the next step on your journey. One of the main draws of the JRPG genre is the promise of getting to experience a deep, rich story full of fun and memorable characters. That's not the case here. Without any of the ingredients that add spice to a story, the game's plot passes like a breeze, leaving no real impression on you as you move through the game. Nothing feels significant or real, and you almost forget you're playing an RPG. Final Fantasy's story has aged like milk. By every metric of modern video game storytelling, it fails. But this is a retrospective, so let's give credit where credit is very much due. Final Fantasy was one of the most engaging, well-developed stories of its generation. It might not look like much today, but for the kids who grew up with the NES, it was a great leap forward. Final Fantasy was a product of its time, a time before the JRPG genre even existed, before the expectations we now have on RPGs were set. So it's only fair to point out that the Final Fantasy series was one of the key drivers of story and character in video games. Step by step, game by game, Final Fantasy helped set these expectations. Without Final Fantasy, storytelling in video games would not be what it is today. Over more than 30 years, the Final Fantasy series has gone through tremendous leaps of innovation, dizzying changes to gameplay, and many different art directions. The one constant has been the music. Final Fantasy has received enormous acclaim for its beautiful soundtracks, many of which are among the most celebrated and well-loved video game compositions of all time. Frankly, there aren't many video game franchises that even come close. While many talented composers have contributed to the body of work that is the collected Final Fantasy soundscape, the series' musical triumphs owe most of its legacy to one man in particular. At the time Final Fantasy entered development, Nobuo Uematsu was in his 20s. As a contributor at Square, he had already composed the scores for more than a dozen games. Despite this, Uematsu was hardly a veteran. He had joined Square only the year before and was still working part-time at a music rental store to pay the bills. Composing music for video games, he thought at the time, was just a way to earn some extra money on the side. There's no doubt in my mind that Uematsu is one of the greatest composers of all time. And I don't mean just in video game music, I mean like in music, period. But with the Famicom's primitive sound chip, he had his work cut out for him. The 8-bit console was only able to produce a handful of sounds, all of which had a very artificial quality to them, and could be piercing and extremely grating when looped for long periods of time. Even as an early Miltard who grew up with the NES, I have to say that I can barely stand listening to this stuff today. I ended up getting a headache and turning the sound off. Mom, Dad, I'm so sorry. I honestly don't know how you put up with this crap. It's a shame, because Final Fantasy had some really great compositions. The classic Victory Fanfare is here, Matoya's Cave is great, and the Final Fantasy main theme, aka Prologue, which plays when the heroes cross the bridge from Cornelia, is one of the most iconic pieces of video game music ever made. I found this hilarious comment while doing research, which calls it the National Anthem of JRPG. Which is just... yes. Yes. <laughs> 
Uematsu and his peers have iterated on these musical pieces over time, making them more and more complex. But even the horrible sound chip of the NES cannot obscure the brilliance of the original compositions. There is one thing that almost all modern games have in common, regardless of genre, and that is tutorials. The first thing you'll notice when you start up Final Fantasy is the total lack of information. There are no tooltips explaining the character classes you choose from. You're supposed to buy your starting equipment, but the shops don't tell you how strong the different weapons and armors are. It doesn't even tell you who can use them. And if you want to learn a spell, you'd have to guess what it does. Welcome to the 80s. Back then, you weren't expected to just charge into a game unprepared. There wasn't a lot of space on the game cartridge to devote to in-game tutorials or help menus. What they had was manuals. The expectation was that you'd read the manual before starting the game. Plus, this gave you something to do on car rides with your parents when you were far away from your Nintendo. We didn't have cell phones, or the internet, or the Nintendo Switch either, so... To play Final Fantasy, you pretty much need to use the manual. This thing is amazing. It's called the Explorer's Handbook, and they weren't kidding. The manual is 80 pages long, and so much of how to play the game is explained in these pages. It shows you how to form an effective party of characters, how to conquer your foes in battle, how to outfit your characters and how to keep them alive. And it even has a bunch of super useful tables at the back listing every weapon and armor in the game, including their stats and which classes can use them. You know, the kind of stuff you'd expect the game to show you. But the manual goes further than just explaining how to play the game. It's actually got a step-by-step -step walkthrough of this story, including what places to go and what bosses you'll be fighting along the way. It's pretty much a strategy guide for the first two-thirds of the game, complete with dungeon maps and a bestiary showing every single monster in the game, including the final boss. Although it's been blacked out to give you something to look forward to, I guess. Given how little information the game itself gives you, the manual is a fantastic resource, Without it, the game can be almost bewildering at times. Just as an example, to get the airship without the manual's aid, you'd have to randomly backtrack all the way to Elfland and talk to the NPCs there to pick up the clues you need. Doable, sure, but extremely frustrating. I found myself referencing the manual a lot, checking the weapons and armor tables every time I picked up new gear, navigating dungeons by the maps at the back, and figuring out the effects of spells before buying. Intuitive design and clever in-game tutorials are obviously preferable, but flipping through a paper manual to figure out your strategy is a super old-school experience, and a surprisingly satisfying one. If you asked me to describe Final Fantasy's gameplay in two words, I would say random encounters. How about four words? Random encounters all day. About 80% of everything you'll do in Final Fantasy is going to be fighting monsters in random encounters. Whether you're walking over land, sailing the seas, or descending a dungeon, pretty much the whole game is about walking from one point to another, and every step you take puts you closer to that next random encounter. The constant battles would be bad enough on their own, but they're made even worse by one simple fact. There's really no other way to say this. The game's combat system is boring. Modern RPGs show an enormous range in their approach to combat, with everything from real-time action to turn-based menu systems and various hybrids available on the market. But they all have one thing in common. They all lavish great attention and affection on their respective combat systems, with the aim of providing enough complexity and tactical variety to ensure a satisfying experience that forms one of the highlights of gameplay. You're expected to make tactical decisions using a variety of attacks, spells and special moves to respond to the situation as it arises. In short, combat is supposed to be exciting and satisfying, not boring. When people think about classic Final Fantasy games, they think about Active Time Battle, an ingenious hybrid between real-time strategy and turn-based combat. That system, however, was only pioneered in Final Fantasy IV. The original Final Fantasy had a pure turn-based combat system, where you issue commands to all of your four characters before the start of each round. Your characters and the monsters then take turns carrying out those actions, until everyone's taken a turn and then it's time to pick the next set of moves. 
In practice, you mostly end up just attacking. There really isn't much you can do. The biggest problem is magic. Magic is generally weak, but even when it isn't, the amount of spells you can cast is so limited, you can't afford to waste them on random encounters. Unlike most modern RPGs, spells don't cost magic points or mana. Instead, spellcasters are limited to casting a certain number of spells of each spell level before resting. Each time you cast a spell of a certain spell level, you use up one of your available points for that particular level. So, for example, Cure and Fire are both level 1 spells. If a red mage casts Fire, that's one less Fire or Cure spell he can cast that day. If that was his last available level 1 spell point, he cannot cast Fire or Cure again before resting, but he can still cast level 2 spells, assuming he has points available for that spell level. If you're not confused right now, you're probably a Dungeons & Dragons player. Yep, this magic system is taken straight out of the granddaddy of all RPGs, D&D. The number of spells per spell level is capped at 9, but even for level 1 spells, you won't hit that cap until the very end of the game unless you do some serious overleveling. Now, this system isn't inherently a bad idea. I think it works fine in Dungeons & Dragons, but that's because D&D is a game where you're expected to fight maybe 4 or 5 times before resting. In a game that's basically about fighting endless random encounters, it's really not the best fit. Besides the lack of magic as a viable option in most situations, there's also no special abilities or tactical actions to take, and healing potions are pretty much useless in combat. The only real tactical element is in how you navigate around one of the game's worst design features the lack of auto-targeting. Since Final Fantasy is a turn-based system with a strong random element, it's common for monsters to die before one or more of your characters make their attack. You know how in every single turn-based game you've ever played, if a character's attack targets a monster that's already dead, the attack will hit another monster instead? That's called auto-targeting. To be honest, I didn't even know there was a term for this. I thought it was just like common courtesy. But Final Fantasy does not have this feature. If a targeted monster dies before a character tries to hit it, the result is an ineffective attack. Basically, you lose the action. This is super frustrating, especially since the combat is so luck-based. Attacks often miss, especially in the first half of the game, and when they do hit, the damage varies by a lot. The key skill you need to develop to master Final Fantasy is to be good at guessing how many more attacks it will take to finish off each monster. The better you get at this, the more damage you can spread out among the monsters and make the battles go faster. For most of the game, that's pretty much all the battles come down to. Until, that is, you get access to the most unique and interesting feature in Final Fantasy. Spellcasting items. One of the defining features and highlights of the RPG genre is the emphasis the games usually place on character customization. Leveling up characters, outfitting them with more and more powerful weapons and armor, and poring over skill trees, talents, and perks can often be just as fun, if not more so, than exploration and combat. For an 8-bit game, Final Fantasy appears to offer a remarkable amount of depth in this area. There's six different character classes to choose from, 64 different spells, and nearly a hundred items to use or equip. It seems like a lot, at first glance, but in reality, the amount of meaningful choice you have is limited. Final Fantasy begins by asking you to create a party of four characters by selecting their classes from a list of six possible options. Fighter, Thief, Black Belt, White Mage, Black Mage, and Red Mage. This is a unique approach for the series, no other mainline Final Fantasy game has ever let you create your own characters, with the obvious exception of Final Fantasy XI and XIV, which are both MMORPGs. The choices you make during character creation will drastically alter the experience you'll have with the game. Unlike later games in the series where characters can switch classes on the fly through a job system, the choices you make at the start of Final Fantasy are permanent. And trust me, all classes are not created equal. The thief is a joke, the black belt is situational, and even the mages aren't that impressive. Honestly, the party creation screen is pretty much this game's difficulty setting. Easy mode? Go with four fighters. Ultra hard mode? 
Four black mages. Good luck with that, by the way. Creating your party at the start of the game is kinda cool and adds some replayability to the game, but I found myself longing for a system like Final Fantasy 3 or 5 where you can switch your jobs on the fly as you learn more about the game and adapt your playstyle accordingly. Playing this game really made me appreciate what a revolution the job system in those games was. One of the more meaningful choices you'll have to make is picking what spells to learn. Spells are bought in shops and each spell level has a total of 4 white magic spells and 4 black magic spells. So for example, level 1 white magic spells are Cure, Harm, Fog and Ruse. But each spellcaster can only learn a maximum of 3 spells per spell level. So if you're a white mage or a black mage, you'll have to choose which 3 of the 4 available spells at each spell level you want. Red mages have it even harder, since both white and black magic spells count towards the same limit. But the most interesting form of character customization in Final Fantasy is actually something that sneaks up on you towards the end of the game. This is sort of a happy accident, a result of two features that have an unintended synergy. That is, spellcasting items and the game's clunky inventory system. Spellcasting items are weapons and armor that can be equipped as normal, but can also be used in combat through the item command to invoke a specific spell, without consuming the item. This is incredibly overpowered for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it breaks the game's magic economy, by allowing you to cast a spell every single turn without consuming any resources. Secondly, because any character can hold and use any spellcasting item, even if they cannot equip it. Spellcasting items are rare, and most are found quite late in the game, but when you do get them, they're a game changer. With just a couple of spellcasting items in your possession, suddenly your options in combat explode. Mages that used to be relegated to tickling monsters with pitiful physical attacks while saving their magic for boss monsters and emergencies can now cast spells every single turn. In a strange way, spellcasting items end up working a lot like materia in Final Fantasy VII. They give access to spells, but each one takes up a valuable equipment slot, since characters in Final Fantasy are limited to carrying 4 pieces of armor and 4 weapons. In the late game, you have some tough choices to make. Do you want to keep those gloves for the extra absorption, or would you rather have the black shirt that lets you cast eyes too? Since any character can use any spellcasting item, you essentially get to build your ideal party by dividing these items between your characters as you see fit. Wanna have a fighter that can be a healer in a pinch? Give him the healing stuff. Want a white mage capable of offensive magics? Give him the Thor's hammer or the Zeus's gauntlet. It's actually pretty cool. As fun as they are, spellcasting items are representative of a deeper problem with Final Fantasy. The game balance is a joke. Modern RPGs are often carefully calibrated to ensure an experience where the player feels challenged without actually putting them at too great a risk of losing. In my opinion, this approach comes with problems of its own and can definitely be overdone, but it's easy to see the appeal when you dip your feet into an old school RPG like Final Fantasy. This is a game for people who love to play roulette. How a random encounter plays out all depends on which of your characters is targeted, and that's all down to luck. Basically, Final Fantasy has this weird thing called a marching order. By hitting the select button outside of combat, you bring up a menu where you can arrange your party members from top to bottom. What this actually does is, characters closer to the top will get attacked more often by monsters. The first character in the marching order will get targeted by monsters 50% of the time, so you'll obviously want your beefiest character at the top of the list. But that still leaves a 50% chance that a monster will target someone else. Mages should be at the back of the marching order and so they won't get attacked nearly as often, but they cannot wear even half decent armor, so when they do get hit, they take a truckload of damage. Like seriously, a hundred times as much damage. The same monster that barely touches your fighter will demolish your black mage in two hits. Random encounters are scary, because every battle could be your last. There is really only one way to mitigate that risk, and if you've ever played a classic JRPG, you know what I'm gonna say. Yep, you gotta grind some levels. For a classic RPG, Final Fantasy isn't a very long game. Altogether, it took me about 22 hours to finish the story. Despite this, the game requires a great deal of patience to get through. This is because the vast majority of Final Fantasy's playtime is spent grinding for experience and gold. 
Final Fantasy is a game more about the preparations than the journey itself. You can head straight to the game's first dungeon, the Temple of Fiends, without even setting foot in town, but it will most likely result in a game over. You start the game weak, and it's your job to level your characters up and outfit them with the best gear money can buy before taking that next step on your quest. Leveling up is a slow process, especially in the early game, and gold is hard to come by. Each time you reach a new town, you'll have to fight a ton of random encounters to afford even a single upgrade to your gear. As an example, I spent 3 straight hours fighting monsters in the forest around Elfland to get the gold for a pair of silver swords. To be fair, those swords ended up being way better than anything I would see for a long while and I think the game meant for me to buy them on the return trip, but given how hard the road ahead turned out to be, even with the silver swords, attempting the journey without them would have really sucked. Grinding for levels is important, not just because of Final Fantasy's unforgiving combat, but because of how stingy the game is, with the one thing that's always sure to lower a gamer's blood pressure. Save points. In Final Fantasy, you can only save your game by resting at an inn or by using a tent, cottage or house item on the world map. Dungeons have no save points, even before the final boss. That means you have to make it all the way through the dungeon and defeat the boss without ever saving your game. Yeah. Final Fantasy is not a test of skill or intelligence, but of endurance. The reality is that a single stroke of bad luck can end a run, setting you back an hour or more of progress, so it pays to come prepared. Overall, I'd estimate that I spent about half my time with the game straight up grinding random encounters to be able to safely continue the story. But as frustrating as the experience can be, I have to admit that the game's core model still works. Even in its most primitive form, grinding can feel incredibly rewarding. There's a real sense of satisfaction in getting stronger, seeing your bank account grow, or picking up a shiny new weapon or armor. Final Fantasy may be a simple tale, but it has all the appeal of a classic rags to riches story. In the beginning, you're running from wolves. At the end, you're flying in an airship and slaying dragons with Excalibur. It's no wonder this gameplay model has been so successful for 30 plus years. That being said, one thing I really missed in this game was getting item drops from defeated monsters. Yep, just another RPG staple that, surprise surprise, isn't in the original Final Fantasy. But for all the things I felt were missing in Final Fantasy, there were some other things I did not expect to find. I've already said that Final Fantasy has a linear story. The same is true for the game's level design. Mostly. At the time of its release, Final Fantasy's vast world map must have felt absolutely enormous, and would have been a huge draw. But this is not exactly an open world experience. While multiple locations often open up at the same time, there's usually a set order you need to visit them in. Sure, open world games do usually have a linear main story you need to follow, but they're also full of optional locations and side quests that can keep the player busy for hours on end without even touching the main quest line, and that's just not true here. But there are some exceptions. At its best, the game has surprisingly strong elements of one of the most celebrated styles of video game design. Metroidvania. Metroidvania games feature a large interconnected world where many areas and rewards are initially off limits and can be accessed only after the player gets their hands on tools, weapons or abilities in the game, which usually also unlock shortcuts that reduce the amount of backtracking needed. You wouldn't normally associate Metroidvania with Final Fantasy, but it's really not that much of a stretch. Final Fantasy's world map is huge. But the Warriors of Light are at first restricted to the immediate area around Cornelia. After the heroes defeat Garland, the king orders the construction of a bridge that allows access to a larger section of the map, including the port town of Pravoka. There, the heroes get their hands on a ship that lets them sail around the Aldian Sea, giving them easy access to Cornelia and several new locations. Completing a string of quests rewards the heroes with TNT, which the dwarf Neric then uses to open a canal between the Aldian Sea and the ocean. This really blows the world wide open, by giving the heroes full access to the southern continents, while the northern continents remain off-limits because they have no ports to dock the ship in. In the town of Crescent Lake, the heroes receive the canoe, 
which lets them dock the ship at river mouths as well as travel across and along any of the world's rivers. This is actually quite a game changer. Not only does the canoe unlock three new dungeons, Mount Golg, the Ice Cave and Castle Ordeals, which can be completed independently of each other and in any order, but the canoe also comes with another benefit. Rivers that once formed impassable barriers can now be effortlessly crossed, opening up a bunch of shortcuts all across the map. This benefit is powerfully demonstrated by the town of Crescent Lake itself, which is surrounded by snaking rivers that had to be bypassed on the long journey there. Textbook Metroidvania stuff. The design of the canoe is genius, and my only complaint is that you don't get it sooner. Finally, after completing the ice cave, the heroes can obtain the airship, opening up the rest of the world map and allowing you to quickly and easily backtrack to any location in the game. Not to mention that there are no random encounters in the skies. Overall, there's a great sense of progression to the game's level design. The way the world opens up step by step with the ship, canoe and airship gives a feeling of freedom that's hard to beat even today. But enough praise, let's get back to talking about the game's flaws, shall we? In modern game design, we often talk about quality of life. It's kind of a funny term when you think about it, especially now that gaming has become such a lifestyle. But anyway, quality of life refers to features or aspects of game design that help to make the experience of playing the game smoother and less frustrating. It's not so much about the core game design, but more about how you actually interact with the game. I basically see it as filling a similar role to user experience in software and web design, where the goal is to make the system's features and functions as intuitive, engaging and satisfying to use as possible. Obviously this means different things for different games, but I think we can all agree that there are good and bad ways to implement the same basic idea. So when it comes to quality of life in Final Fantasy, it's more like FML. I don't have to spell that out, right? There are so many awful design choices in this game, whether it's from technical limitations, bad ideas or inexperience. And I'm just gonna list a few of my favorites here. Battles run really slow. All the combat information like damage numbers, critical hits and misses are shown through text boxes instead of graphics. You can adjust how fast these messages pop up on the main menu, but even on the fastest setting when you barely have time to read the text, this whole system eats up a lot of time. On the standard setting, it's pretty much unplayable. Weapons and armor shops don't show the stats of the items they sell so you cannot tell if it's better than what you're already using. They don't show who can use the items either, you'll just have to check the manual. The same kind of thing goes for magic shops. They don't show who can use the spell, they don't show which characters already have it, and remember how each character can only learn 3 spells for each level? Well, there's no way to drop a spell you've already learned, so good luck if you made a mistake. Speaking of shops, there's also no way to buy multiple items in one go. You burn through a lot of heal potions in dungeons, so this can be a real pain. Check how long it took me to stock up on like 80 potions. Treasure chests have the same graphic whether they're open or closed, so you can't tell which ones you've already opened. Some spells like Life and Soft, which cures petrification, can't be used in combat. The game will still let you cast the spell, but it won't work. Inventory management. Oh. This deserves a video of its own, but I'll try to make it quick. Weapons and armor don't go in the shared inventory. Instead, each character has their own personal inventory for equipment. Each character can carry a total of 4 pieces of armor and 4 weapons. That means that if every character is already fully equipped, you'd have to discard one of those items before you can pick up something new. And unless you have a guide at your disposal, you won't even know what's in the treasure chest until you've already thrown away a precious piece of armor or weapon to make space for it. Even with a guide, you're in for some tough choices towards the end of the game. With all that being said, one particular feature of Final Fantasy is absolutely, by far, the worst. Poison. The way poison works is a war crime. There's a pretty decent number of monsters in this game that can cause poison when they hit you with an attack. When a character is poisoned, they'll obviously take damage every turn in combat, and the condition also persists outside of battle, causing the character to take one point of damage with every step they take. 
Fair enough, but poison isn't cured by resting at an inn or in a cottage. So unless you have an antidote potion or a pure spell to cast, which is a level 4 spell by the way and costs a ton of gold to buy, your only option is to let the character die and then resurrect them at a clinic, which can also cost a lot of money depending on where you are. Even late in the game, when you're wealthy enough to keep a bunch of antidotes in your inventory, poison is still super annoying. The problem being that when a character gets poisoned, they're automatically placed last in the party's marching order. So every single time a character gets poisoned, you have to go into this submenu and switch them back. This is so annoying. It got to the point where I just groan out loud every time a character got poisoned. Oh, and one last thing before we leave this topic behind. The game only has a single save file. Not a big deal now, but can you imagine how many friendships this must have ruined back in the 80s? I will admit, it's kind of unfair to apply principles of modern game design to a game that's over 30 years old. It's almost like showing up at a kindergarten to critique the kids' drawings. But I do think it's worth taking a look at what kind of player behavior Final Fantasy's game design actually encourages. And this is what I found. Random encounters are frequent, tedious, and unpredictable. Healing is limited. There are no save points in dungeons. As a result, Final Fantasy encourages a safe, risk-averse playstyle. The smartest strategy is to fight monsters near town to grind levels, and then run from every single battle in the dungeons. The way it plays out almost ends up looking a little bit like a speedrun. Intentionally or not, the dungeons are designed to support this approach. The critical path for each dungeon, meaning the shortest possible route that will take you from the entrance to the end, is usually not that long. Instead, dungeons have extensive branching paths, loops, and dead ends that are either empty or hold treasure chests. From a decision-making standpoint, I have to admit that this is an interesting design. Every time you hit a branch, you have a tough decision to make. Which way is the path forward, and which leads to more random encounters that will further drain your resources? Every time you choose to go for a chest, it's a gamble. The path to the chest will add steps to your journey, and many chests are also guarded by fixed encounters with extra strong monsters. Is it really worth it? This is especially true if you're playing without a guide, since chests can contain anything from 10 gil to a super powerful weapon. There's just no way of knowing until you open it. My favorite part of the game was the volcano, Mount Golg. The dungeon has a sprawling, labyrinthine layout. It's covered in lava tiles that reduce the character's hit points with each step, and it has lots of optional treasure guarded by some really nasty monsters. All of these elements tie together neatly to create a feeling of mounting tension as you descend deeper and deeper into the volcano, further and further from the safety of your last save point. With each step and each random encounter, you expend more of your resources, and you know you've still got a deadly foe waiting for you at the bottom of the dungeon. It really does feel like a fantasy adventure. It's so tense. On the bottom level of the volcano, one of the side rooms holds a treasure chest guarded by a vicious red dragon. This, to me, represents the very essence of Final Fantasy's design philosophy. Through luck and perseverance, you've made it to the end. You stand at the threshold of the Fire Fiend's lair, but now the game tempts you. If you have the guts to go for the glory, you can take a little detour and challenge a powerful monster that may well be as dangerous as the Fire Fiend herself for the chance to win a tantalizing reward. And just so you understand how important luck is in this game, that red dragon ended up demolishing me the first time I tried it. On my second try, I killed it in a single round. This design philosophy culminates in the Flying Fortress, the game's penultimate dungeon. The final approach to the Wind Fiend is a long bridge where you have a small but very real chance of running into the game's most powerful enemy by far, War Mech. This is a truly brutal encounter, and if you don't get to go first, you will probably die. At the very last part of the whole dungeon, right before the boss, without any save point along the way, and there's nothing you can do to prevent it. But here's the thing. In the eyes of a modern gamer, 
war mech might seem hideously unfair, but when you see it from the perspective of an 80s gamer, it's not a flaw in the game's design, it's a feature, because when it really comes down to it, this is all a matter of changing expectations. Before I go on, I just want to say if you enjoyed this video, I'd be super grateful if you could hit the like button and leave a quick comment, as it really helps the video reach more people. And if you want to support me, consider subscribing to my channel, so I know people want to see more videos like this. You don't scold a toddler for being bad at walking. Final Fantasy is a game that predates game design theory. In the 80s, the video game industry was still in its infancy, and people just didn't know what they were doing. It was a crazy melee of random genius and opportunistic ideas. Final Fantasy was a flash of brilliance in a time of unbridled experimentation. It had enormous potential, but it was ultimately a product of its time. In an era when most console games were content to provide bite-sized, arcade-like experiences, Final Fantasy served up an epic quest, a vast world to explore, and seemingly endless adventure. So what if the game was linear, what it felt like you could go anywhere? So what if the battle system was slow and lacked tactical depth, when there were over a hundred different monsters to find and slay? These days, the vast majority of games are sold to you with the expectation that you will beat them. Games are curated experiences, carefully designed to deliver a fun and satisfying playtime in their own unique ways. Usually, but not always, that means providing a suitable challenge that will keep you engaged without frustrating you too much, so that you'll eventually finish the game after a reasonable amount of hours and remember it fondly long enough to buy the next game the company puts out. It wasn't always like that. Games from the 80s and 90s were built to last, and that often meant making them frustrating, unfair, and sometimes ridiculously hard. You weren't expected to beat them. Back then, being good enough at a game to finish that final stage or boss gave you bragging rights. A lot of what seemed like flaws today would have been draws in 1987. Without the internet to guide you, a game like Final Fantasy with its massive open world and impressive amount of content would have been a true journey of discovery. You'd have to learn the game by trial and error, experiment with classes, weapons and spells, learn where different monsters could be encountered, and which ones were worth the fight and which to run from. You'd have to make notes, draw maps, and figure out the best approach to get you through the dungeon safely. And the final steps at the very bottom of the Temple of Fiends, and the climactic battle against Chaos, would have been a pulse-pounding, nail-biting experience. A memory to last a lifetime. But as great an experience as the original Final Fantasy once was, a lot has changed over the last 35 years. At the beginning of this video, I posed a simple question. Is Final Fantasy still worth playing? After my first few hours with the game, I would have said, no, it's not. The story is barely a story, there aren't any characters to care about, the combat is boring and frustrating, and your characters get poisoned all the time. But then something started happening. The more I played, the more engaged I got. Dungeons started getting interesting. I felt a growing urge to grind for levels and gold, and I honestly wanted to see how the story would end. For all its flaws, the basic RPG formula is there. Inventory management, leveling characters, collecting gold, exploring strange new places. It's all just kind of fun. After I finished the game, I started having this strange feeling in the pit of my stomach. It took me days to finally figure out what it was. Wistfulness. As much as the game had frustrated me, as happy as I was to finish the game and be done with it, Final Fantasy had somehow made its way into my heart. It had become a happy memory. At the end of the day, I'm glad I played through this game, and I feel blessed to have experienced it. So I guess my answer is, yes, it's absolutely worth playing today. If you want to embrace a part of gaming history, and experience something magical and wonderful that once brought so much joy and sense of accomplishment to people. Or if you want to see the game that spawned a franchise, the game that saved Hironobu Sakaguchi's career. That's a humbling thought. Final Fantasy was far from a perfect game. Square didn't get everything right the first time around, 
but they had a good foundation, and they kept working at it, and each time they did a little better until they had something magical, something golden. Just think about that. If this game hadn't been as good as it was, if it hadn't sold as well as it did, if it hadn't saved Square from bankruptcy, there wouldn't be a Final Fantasy VI. There wouldn't be a Final Fantasy VII. So no matter which Final Fantasy game is your personal favorite, I think we can all agree that without the original Final Fantasy, the world would be a much darker place. Hironobu Sakaguchi and his team were the original Warriors of Light, and their hard work and dedication rekindled the light of the crystals. The Final Fantasy series has brought so much joy to millions of people around the world. It's told stories that have so much meaning. It's introduced us to characters that are so important to us. Can you imagine if none of that ever existed? It's frankly mind-blowing, and it breaks my heart to think that with every promising game that failed to sell well, there's a potential game franchise that failed to get off the ground. What might have been if they'd had just a few more chances to perfect their craft? So if there is any message to take away from this video, it's this. Creative work is hard. It's a soul-wrenching experience to create something from nothing, and then pray that people will love it. So don't disparage the people that try. Don't hate them for failing. Love them for trying. Because someone out there has another Final Fantasy in them. And to everyone out there who's slaving away in front of the screen, trying to create something new and unique, don't give up. Never ever give up. Please. In the end, these are just my personal opinions. Whether you agree or disagree, I'd love to hear more about your experiences with the original Final Fantasy in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and have a great day!